Uh, welcome, welcome to our presentation. Uh, today we'll be, we'll be talking about the project that Evolving Web has been working on more than others. It's kind of our big project for the summer and uh, it's, it's almost done. We're quite proud of it and so we'd like to share with you what we learned and how it went. Uh, the client here is uh, the Princeton University Press. Don't be confused, it's a sort of a non-profit publishing house that's associated closely with the Princeton University, but it's, it's not the same entity. It's on campus though, and it's, uh, it's got a very famous uh, tradition. Uh, if you have any academic books on your bookshelf, they, some of them might be from them. Uh, so about us, my name is Alex Durgachev. I co-founded Evolving Web uh, 10 years ago, and uh, I'm Durgachev on Twitter and GitHub, and uh, I do lots of community stuff as well. I'm, I love to go to all these camps. I, I know I'm a lot of faces here, and uh, I, yeah. Uh, yeah, my name is Matt Cork. So I've been with Evolving Web uh, for almost exactly a year now. I've been using Drupal since, uh, as I usually say, since Pluto was a planet. Um, uh, my my username on on. Uh, IRC in various other places is, is uh, MVC. Our company, Evolving Web, has been uh, it's, it's 10 years old, and we've been doing Drupal for about nine of those years. Uh, we've done projects big and small. We've got a great training program. Uh, we're based out of Old Montreal in Quebec. And uh, as usual, we're always looking for good people to work with. So if this is the kind of project that you like, please uh, you know, reach out to us and start the conversation. Um, over the last years, you know, we've done we've done work for for some cool companies. Uh, some ones we, we like to feature are for Linux Foundation, uh, for the Press, uh, for Quebec Original, which is the Tourism Quebec website, uh, and lots of lots of others. Um, so, in terms of in terms of uh, our approach, you know, we we often we're a small team, so we often work when we work with a larger company. We we are very collaborative. We use their resources as much as possible and we try to teach them Drupal best practices. Um, we have some hybrid estimation and agile approach. Uh, so we, we're not just, you know, PHP developers, but, you know, we, most of us are very comfortable with, with Linux and lower level stuff and also with JavaScript. So it's, we, we try to have good expertise throughout the whole stack. And, uh, you know, we're open source guys, so we actually we, we use Jira when our clients demand it, and we use Redmine internally for pretty much everything. And Basecamp for client communication, Slack, and so on. Uh, in, in terms of uh, what kind of stuff we do, of course, great design, theming, uh, but also infrastructure, multilingual, search, um, lots of migrations, and lots of custom dev. Uh, so that's, that's our company, and our client is the press. Uh, it's, uh, like I mentioned, it's, a, it's an independent publisher. Uh, and uh, you know they've they've been around for over a hundred years. They've they have uh, published many tens of thousands of books, and, and you know like ten thousand books in print. Uh, and uh, they're one of the most prestigious uh, academic publishing houses. So you've probably heard of also Oxford University Press and, and so on. Um, so their current site, as befitting a very prestigious institution with a strong legacy is a legacy site that's like 20 years old. It's, believe it or not, it's static HTML. It's, uh, I think it was made sometime in the 90s or you know, 15 years ago, and, uh, and then been refreshed with the, where they changed the header and the footer to insert, insert the new logo. Uh, but aside from that, it's been a site that's been evolving. So it has a lot of content on it. It's got 9,000 published works. It's got lots of Einstein-related papers. It has a lot of like sample chapters, table of contents ancillary files, some blogs. So this is the site. It's kind of like a static site with a lot of stuff on it. Um, it does have some moving parts, so it has some mini sites that we realized after the fact exist. Uh, it's got a, a WordPress blog bolted on, it's got a PHP list newsletter, which they probably should move away from eventually. Uh, it has a, like a little legacy Perl CGI search application, uh, and it uses Google Book Search quite a bit. They have the ability to buy books, and uh, believe it or not, they have not have one, but two built-in shopping carts. Uh, one for the US and North American market, kind of the Americas, and then one basically out of the UK from Wiley, their partner and distributor. And, uh, and that one kind of handles Europe and Asia and Africa. Um, and they, so they have, as you see, two shopping carts that you can add stuff to. Um, 
all of this stuff, all of these books uh, get generated, a static HTML, and thrown on an FTP server. Uh, in addition to this, uh, they generate an Onyx format XML feed. If you're in the publishing world, you'll be familiar with Onyx as, as the, the metadata format for, that public publishing companies use. And that also gets thrown to other FTP servers that their distributors have, that Amazon.com has, and that's how Amazon has the, all the updated data and all the images. Uh, and uh, yeah, they have lots of audios and videos scattered and embedded throughout the content, and uh, they're planning to move and standardize on Vimeo going forward. Um, for this project, what we did is we uh, did a big analysis of what, uh, what they had which was a SQL Server database and a lot of VB scripts that read this database and from this metadata that they extract all the relevant bits and pieces from the site and they throw it onto the static HTML which gets manually copied to, a, to an FTP server. Uh, we also did a content audit. Uh, we, we kind of are taken aback to find out how much other static content they had beyond what we were initially thought you know, came from this VB script. Uh, because they had 20 years worth of static HTML, so stuff really crafts up. Um, so we did that. We had uh, then moved everything to Drupal. The mandate was initially described to us as a lift and shift, and then we initially described to the client that there's no such thing as lift and shift. But uh, nonetheless, uh, the, the idea is to move to Drupal, their existing site, without changing too much. Uh, in part, there's a, there's a secondary mandate that the organization is expecting to go forward with a big redesign where they're going to say what is their brand identity on the web in the 21st century and uh, how should that be reflected on the site. So the idea was to take what you guys saw and move it out to Drupal. Uh, however, they, they did recognize that in 2017 you need to be responsive. It's just crazy not to be. So they, they, that gave us an in to make some design changes. Uh, you know, just basically fix things and make it responsive was, was the, the instruction we got. Um, the other thing is the, these VB scripts were quite heavy uh, and uh, not robust, to put it lightly. So we were asked to write a synchronization process that would get all their data from this, from the central system and, and get, get it magically inside of Drupal synchronized every night. Uh, and after some consideration, you know, the, the team uh, that they have there, they don't have, unlike other like other clients we've had, or unlike even Princeton University, when you have your own sysadmin team, the, the publishing house doesn't have a huge IT department, web hosting is not really their specialty, so we came to the conclusion pretty fast that they should be put on a, on a, on a, on a host like Pantheon or Acquia or something like that that, that gives you managed Drupal hosting, uh, which has the benefit that they don't have to worry too much about it, and at the same time, evolving web doesn't really have a good lock-in on this. This is, as a small company, our goal is to get clients locked in, so we were happy to, to put them in a good place. Uh, so this, this was the mandate, we had a couple of months to do it. Uh, so first, first things, uh, you know, it sounds pretty simple, right? It's a static HTML website. How, how hard could it be? I mean, it's got no features. You just click around and, and look, at, look at books. Um, the shopping carts, by the way, are all external. Like, they're basically just like a minimum JavaScript integration. So, so we start the project, we, you know, we had an idea of what, what it was going to take, but then we start. Um, so we start looking at the database, this uh, SQL Server database, and we were trying to figure out how we're going to integrate that with Drupal. And first of all, we figured out that there's like 30, 30 tables in there. Um, some, a couple of the tables, such as the works, like the books table, have like, I don't know, 50 fields, of which maybe a third of them are being used in the website, and the rest are not. They're used in other parts of their organization. So we had to do a big audit of all the tables, of all the fields, what do they have in them, we have some sample, sample content from them so we know how to display it. We, if they're bold, you can't quite see it in the slides, but if they're bold, then they're used in Drupal. If they're not, we can just ignore them. So uh, that would, If they're bold, they're being used currently in the existing website, yeah. and the other fields are just used for other internal purposes, but not the website. So we assume if it wasn't used for the old website, we don't need it on the new one. Um, the next thing, so that started with the database and what's there. That's, that's our source data. The next thing is they, they sent us uh, an MSS access database that connected to the remote SQL server database. And this access file contained a bunch of DB scripts embedded in it. 
And it sounds not so bad, right? But it turns out there was like 30 to 50 scripts. Many were duplicate, copied and pasted versions of each other because that was basically their whole code base. It's a static site generator embedded in these VB scripts embedded inside of this access thing with no version control or anything like that. So over, over 15 years, and of course the person who initially wrote it was, was retired. Uh, so over 15 years, lots of versions of these started being around and we just had to go through everything and figure out uh, what, uh, what was there. It was really nice that uh, the, the, the webmaster and the web director of the client were quite helpful in that regard. They, they rescued our butt because I don't think we could have figured it all out on our own. Uh, we're not, we do know VB script a little bit from, from our back, back in the days, but we're not VB experts and, and it's pretty legacy stuff. Um, another little kink with this VB workflow that they had is that about right now it's only about 50 books, but before it used to be more, were marked as special. So the HTML that was generated for those wasn't put it with the same folder as the rest of the HTML generated. It was put into the specials folder. And, uh, and then a webmaster had to go in and manually merge whatever fixes or changes that had been done on production. So they were using Dreamweaver and stuff for that. So uh, a lot of it was because they didn't know how to fix the VB script to, to do what they wanted because it was just too complex. So we're happy to say, got rid of all this special work though. Um, yeah, the, the MSSQL DB was called Anne's Biblio, not to be confused with, Anne was the web director, not to be confused with uh, the, the new system that we'll be moving to next year, also called Virtue Sales Biblio. Uh, they have this web drive, let's see, was it a mounted drive that was accessible to all their, all their workstations inside as W, that's the web drive. And so that's what they were using as FTP. And like I mentioned, the scripts were each individual script was between you know, 50, 500, a couple thousand lines of code, but there was, there was 30 to 50, so there's a lot of lines of code in total. We estimate that there was five to 10 real lines of code and the rest were all duplicates. Um, so we did this audit, thanks with, with the help from the folks at the press. So we had a giant spreadsheet. We, we knew that there was way too many scripts for anyone. There's literally no one around who knew what these things were doing. So what we focused on instead is for every script that we could find, what files did they generate? And so at least we had, a, had an index of all the files and how they mapped. And, and basically we had our list of the templates, you know, the things that Drupal would be responsible for showing. Uh, and then we just opened those things up, like the HTML, and we said, where are these fields? Where do they come from the database? Is it obvious? If it's obvious, we didn't have to look at the script. But if something, if, if several fields were concatenated, or if there's conditional logic in this book, show this field, in that book, show that field, we would have to go in into the VB script and check what the heck it was doing. Uh, to be honest, even now, a few months later, I'm sure we only got, got like 80, 90% of the complexity of those scripts, I'm sure, as the site gets audited and tested some more, uh, we will find little corner cases that somebody five years ago put in. Maybe they don't care about them, maybe they do. We don't know, nobody knows. We did identify a lot of like, very like, custom corner cases that they told us we could just drop, so they were very responsive about, about, that. about reducing uh, complexity, things that they didn't really need and would have taken us three days of extra work. Yeah. It, it might have been a pet feature from, from seven years ago that nobody even remembered, but it was there yeah. for us to discover and figure out what to do. So the existing workflow before we came along was that we have uh, the SQL Server database and they have these VB scripts generating dynamic HTML pages. There's a bunch of file assets, that's on the right. Uh, and there's also a bunch of static HTML. Not just the special pages like we talked about, but there's just a bunch of other HTML because you have an FTP drive, you have a webmaster or three, and you have 15 years, you're gonna have a lot of HTML. Um, so we try to change it up a bit so that we have Biblio, this database server, SQL server, we export using just a very simple PowerShell script. We export all of the tables into CSVs. And we have that on an FTP that we can access. Then we have a Drupal migration that actually runs on cron every night that goes in, checks to see if there's new versions of those uh, CSVs, pulls that in, checks to see which rows in those CSVs have changed, and for any new rows, it makes records. For any updated rows, it updates the records. And for any rows that were deleted, it removes the records. So we, we, we did quite a bit of work to write these migrations. Um, we, we, we've kind of scratched our, scratched our head quite a bit about what to do with a giant collection of accumulated static files, images, PDFs, 
videos, source code. Don't ask me why some book had a source code, but it had source code. Um, did we decide to move it all into Drupal? No. We, uh, we said that's just a recipe for madness. So we decided that the only thing we, we are going to move into Drupal are cover images because you know we have to have resizing and all this beautiful thing and meta tags with images. The rest, we, we told them, your existing web thing can be its own FTP server. It's going to be on a different domain, like assets.press.princeton.edu, and we're going to just update the links. So we shouldn't have any broken links, uh, but you're not going to take all this cruft and move it on into Drupal wholesale. And it's up to their existing web team to clean that up if they want, or, or not, or they can manually bring it into Drupal. Yeah. Well, we also are aware that with Drupal, uh, there's, there's a lot more capacity to build dynamic pages because we have the power of views. Um, so some of the things that were dynamic because of VB script generating them, like a listing of recent books, if they bother to make a VB script for it, then we made a view for it. That was about half of the listings of books. If it, that listing of books was manually edited, we realized that we just didn't have the time to go back and forth and say, look, let's make it dynamically generated. Even if it's really easy, it won't be the same as their listing that was manually generated. And then you'd have to go to them and say, is the new one better or worse? Are you happy? Do we need to make exceptions? We didn't do it in this case, but let's follow up with um, this is This is what we did. We, we wrote, for every single table, we wrote a query that just pulled out only the fields that, that are being used and, uh, and generated these as CSVs. So it's a very simple uh, export feature. Uh, we, we did this because we knew that in the future they're going to shift away from the SQL Server database. They're, they already said they're going to use VirtuSales Biblio. And, uh, and we know that VirtuSales Biblio can make reports out of the data that's been stored in there. As XML, as CSV, it doesn't matter. So. Uh, we didn't want to do anything complex also because this part is running on, by their sysadmin in a cron job on a server we don't control. So if there's any like bugs or errors, there's kind of, we always play broken telephone trying to figure out what's causing it. So we had to make these export sim uh, scripts as, as minimal and, and simple as possible. That's why we don't do any cleanup, any joining, anything. His job, you know, is to take your source data and generate these CSVs straightforward. Um, now we've got to move that into Drupal. I don't expect you to digest this table, but uh, for a static HTML site, you know, you think, oh, you know, with just a single content type, basically books. Turns out, no, there's a little bit of complexity after all. Um, so guys, I think it's, uh, yeah. so the complexity here is that the work uh, content type has a lot of, uh, a lot of, Call of field collections in Drupal 7 terms, or in this case, we use paragraphs, but however you want to think about it. These are entities that don't have their own URL, but they are aggregations of fields uh, that belong in groups to, to each work. So we have uh, the works, we have the author, which have um, you know, many, it's one to many or many to many relationship to works, and then we have a, a bunch of paragraphs related to reviews, links, illustrations, and so on, and then a bunch of fields related to these paragraphs. And of course, taxonomy, taxonomy, taxonomy. Um, so, we then had to, we got access to their FTP server and we realized that there's 77,000 HTML pages there. We're not talking about PDFs here, we're talking about just HTML pages. And, uh, and we kind of had a small heart attack. This was after we already gave an estimate and, and a schedule and all that. Um, for a static site, you know, how hard could it be? Uh, but after we started digging, we realized that 20,000 from that audit, right, from the VB script audit, we realized 20,000 are being generated by the VB scripts and are going to be handled by Drupal templates and views. Fine. 54,000 are actually old versions of generated pages because they wanted to make a backup and through like that back or something and they left it in place. Because, you know, it just accumulates. It's, it's HTML. It's not a dynamic, it's a static website. For all those people who love static site generators, keep this in mind. Um, and then, Turns out that the uh, actual number of HTML pages that had to be manually audited and considered was really only 2,500. Still quite a lot, but a human achievable task. It's, it's, it's not something you can't do with, with you know, a couple of weeks of work. Um, in order to triage all these crazy folders, which of them were garbage, which of them were ancillary files, which, which contained HTML, which didn't, we made a big listing of every folder that has at least one HTML file, because if not, Drupal won't touch it, it just goes on the asset server. So everything that does have HTML file, we collaboratively went through, did our passive, trying to figure out what's there, then their web team 
confirmed, denied, gave us comments, input, and based on this, we were able to cut it down to a much, much smaller list of essential pages, static pages to bring in. Um, I also did a, what I think is a clever thing where I, I, I have my own little FTP H, like static server with, with a backup of the site that, that enables directory listings after you password protect. And, and so I have a link to that. So if you want to see what HTML files are in any folder, you can click right from the, from the Google spreadsheet. So this was the audit. It, it, it was a lot of work. It, it scared us a lot, but fortunately, you know, we're good at this kind of stuff, so we plot on in, into the implementation. Um, and, we did, and we built the site. Uh, we, we, got a, we got our designer to, we, we gave him the instruction, make the site look as similar as possible while recognizing the fact that you're going to make it bootstrap based. You're not going to try to copy a, a design from, from the 90s, right? You're just going to, you're going to make it a modern design that works easily, but pretty much has the same elements. We got very limited mandate to change things or to make decisions because the creative team was not part of this. This is supposed to just be a modern version of the same design. So we still have the same slideshow. We still have just the featured publications on the home page. And um, yeah, the one thing that we did is the two search boxes that they had, we made collapsible because we know JavaScript. And so when you click that little search box, then, then, then the two things pop up. Uh, it's because it's Drupal, because it's bootstrap, because it's clean, it's got much better user experience. It's got much better SEO. Uh, this is not this spaghetti code BB system anymore, but now it's, it's, a, it's a very clean, minimalistic Drupal site with admittedly a very complex migration, bolted on. But uh, yeah, so they, they can, their web team can now just go in and update the content with WYSIWYG. Uh, images are auto resized. Users are much, much happier. Um, so for the homepage specifically, like I said, we, we stuck to the existing look and feel. Whenever there's any doubt, we're not trying to change anything. We're just trying to take the cheapest possible way and make it look not broken and make it responsive. Uh, we did ask them for permission to change the menu. If you guys remember, they had a, a 15 or 20 item left sidebar on every page and that, and that actually would once in a while change because when you get to a different section they would manually edit it but for the most part it was just a static left sidebar and we asked them to make it into a drop down menu. No, I'll just mention that that left sidebar was, uh, was a usability nightmare and it wasn't consistent on every page so it was way too long. It should have been multiple levels so there's like uh, uh, oh, and we, we'll, we'll show you the site soon enough but the there are pages you could only discover by following a trail of length like three to get at some interior pages. It was, yeah, there. Uh, so that, that was what you see on the landing page. And then uh, certain sections of those would change, randomly change the menu on the left in a very unpredictable way. It took us a while to figure out, uh, figure out the initial structure in order to be able to present a structure that made uh, a lot more sense. Yeah, so we, we asked them to come up with a more limited set of items, and we asked them to categorize it according to this drop-down categories, which they were happy to do. It seemed to be uncontroversial, e easier than we thought. Um, and uh, so that was a small step, but I think a huge usability win. Yeah, we, we just took, um, we made a list of everything that was in the left column menu on at least one page, put it in order by rank, by uh, according to Google Analytics data, so we knew what was the most important put things into categories from there and decided, okay, these should be the first level and second level, and there's only a few third level things. But the menu is actually the same on every page, which is a pretty basic idea, but not something on their legacy site. Uh, great. So for the book templates themselves, like I said, there's uh, about 10,000 of those. So that was our main beast of a template. Uh, we, we move things out of the we have the old one now, sorry. But we move things out of the header. There's, they just cram pretty much every single piece of metadata that wasn't the description into that top header part, which, which made it look really confusing. Uh, so we made it more consistent with things that you'd see on Amazon or something. Uh, and uh, yeah, we, we definitely are aware that different books have different fields. And so we made a design that works whether or not they're there. Uh, we still have the same integration with the carts and Google Book Search. Uh, and videos and so on. Yeah. Has, has anyone ever here been in a in a design meeting where you have ten different departments and each say, one says my my little thing has to be above the fold, as if that meant something on a website? So, so yeah, ten years of that. Yeah. There was like ten years of those decisions, and they just shoved everything in. So, so everything became above the fold. So you couldn't. So yeah, everything was a, was a priority, which means nothing was a priority. Right. Um, so. So then 
the actual migration of the book data, so like I mentioned, there was you know something north of 8,000 books. There was uh, 4,000 4, covers. Um, I think there was more than that, but there's a star. Uh, we, uh, yeah, we made sure that all our migrations are incremental because it's a huge, huge migration and we want it to be fast if only a few things change like they do. Because obviously per year there's only like 20, 50, 100 books new ones. Uh, yeah, we make sure that the migrations are running nightly and can be run quickly if they have an urgent change. Uh, and we handle removal of out of print books. Uh, to give you a sense, I don't know if you can see the output of Drush migrate status. But we have, what, like 20 migrations there for these different entities, these paragraphs, these taxonomies, these images. Uh, and as you see, some of these uh, have, like, P, the reviews table has 42,000 records. The uh, ebooks editions table has a couple of thousand. The authors table has 10,000. Yeah, and these are migrating to different entities. So that includes redirects, which are entities. Uh, that includes paragraphs. And then the very last one that runs uh, is the node which actually represents one book. So before that runs all of the different paragraphs, and one of those is the editions. So that can be like the hardcover, the paperback, the DVD version. All of that's been migrated first, and then the, the work node comes and puts it all together, uh, referencing the, uh, getting the node ID from the previously run, sorry, paragraph ID from the previously run migrations. Yeah, so you guys wrap your head around this migrate thing, this, you, you guys know Drupal migrate? Yeah, everybody uses that framework. It's, uh, it's came out as the canonical way to import data into Drupal and it served us really well. Um, however, we did have to write custom code for several things related to the migration, such as source deletion, that doesn't quite work out of the box. Uh, we also had the notion that a lot of Drupal entities, which would correspond to one of these migrations, need not one, but several CSVs that have the fields in it because you have multi-value data associated to it. So uh, our developers actually created like a plugin for multi-CSV joining as if the CSV data source is a almost SQL-like where you can specify. Open these several CSVs and join them on, on this criteria. So uh, obviously if you wanted to keep it more simple, you could have just pulled them into a SQL database uh, and, uh, and just did that. In fact, I don't know why we didn't. But <laughs> We have, we have now an impressive thing to contribute back. There, there, would have been, uh, there would have been more custom code to write that way. Yeah, it definitely would have added moving parts, for sure. Yeah. Uh, because once you change the, those CSVs, there would yeah. be more things to maintain. Yeah, the more, this, this pros and cons. The more moving parts, the more points to fail. Another thing that uh, Migrate Out of the Box doesn't do is support for getting these source files, the, the source CSVs from FTP or SFTP. Uh, we kind of waffled back and forth what they wanted to provide us, so we were able to easily provide support both of them. And this also manages to, for SFTP, it actually connects using SFTP and does an MD5 and sees if the file changed, and looks at timestamps. So try to be smart about uh, detecting changes. Uh, another gotcha was running all of this in cron. So migrate out of the box did not run in cron. Um, so we took a few iterations of getting it right. And we thought we had it right. It was fine. We just ran it from our cron job. And then we moved to Pantheon where the cron timed out quite aggressively, and all of a sudden what we did wasn't fine, so we had to rewrite it uh, to use queue workers. And then we think it's fine, but that was just this week, so we'll let you know. Um, so stay tuned. Uh, there was, of course, some coding issues, as you would expect from any Microsoft uh, SQL Server original data that we worked through. Uh, and uh, there's just a lot of fields, a lot of interrelations, and a lot of legacy complexity that nobody could quite explain, but we muddled through it eventually. Um, one thing that I'm kind of proud of is how, f how few contrib modules we have. Remember, this is mostly a static HTML website. No one's expecting bells and whistles. So what you guys see here are mostly migrate stuff and API helper modules, some basic site building stuff like context and active trail, a little bit of the entity browser for images, uh, and uh, Photo. So really, this is not a, a site where we enabled a bunch of contrib modules and, and called it done. Uh, it, on the other hand, up until the last, you know, last two weeks, I think we only had one custom module, the PEP migrate. So we also had to write no custom code, except the migration. Um, eventually, I think Jigar in the back had to, had to write a views argument handler for some, some advanced uh, 
yeah, stuff. So we didn't we didn't change any URLs on the site. That was uh, I mean, uh, out of scope. Yeah, that was out of scope. Um, uh, would have required approval from too many people. So uh, in order to have a view, uh, yeah, to keep all the, the keep the views arguments looking the same, uh, uh, we had to write a, or Peter had to write uh, some fancy views argument handles. But uh, no. yeah, that, that was a bit of work. But uh, yeah, that's like I think with one other custom mod module other than migration. Yeah. So we have a bunch of these lovely fields, and then uh, displayed correctly. Uh, we cleaned up a bunch of stuff, of course. We had lots of PDFs linked all over the place, and we had to make sure that they're being linked to that new assets subdomain. Uh, we also, in the source data, we had a ebooks table and a books table, and they had like 90% of the same 50 fields. So we kind of didn't, well, we normalized it in Drupal. Uh, we, we had supported ebook, well, sorry, apps. They have apps, and now we support that, and we dealt with stuff. Uh, so that was that. We also took you know, a couple of hundred of the top top pages, according to Google Analytics, the ones, everything that was linked in the menu, anything that you would really miss for being a soft launch, and we imported it ourselves and we cleaned it up as much as time allowed. Um, so we, we did that first pass, the site doesn't look terrible, and we handed it off to their web content team to, to go through the long tail of everything else and fix it up. Um, yeah, of course, we did, uh, we did the, the search in, in, in Drupal views, we did all the listings, all the taxonomy listings uh, inside of views, and, and some things like human print, which was manually a list of books, they can move into a view uh, later. So the next, uh, next section is going live, I'll, I'll leave that to Mark. Um, sure. So uh, yeah, this is just our, our checklist of things that had to happen uh, before the site went live. Right now, it's existing on a beta domain. The, we're expecting the actual hard launch to be in a couple weeks. Um, we already mentioned that we deployed on Pantheon, which means we've been testing in that environment for a month, two months now, maybe, a month or two, um, to work out any specific issues there. Um, we uh, created a, um, a second domain name that points so assets.press.princeton.edu. Uh, that resolves to exactly the same place as our current live domain. That way, uh, so then we rewrote links to PDFs, like their massive pile of legacy PDFs, to, to use that domain name. So it goes to the same place, but after the launch, that domain will, will keep working and will just point to the existing server. So all of their links to uh, like photos and, and like the, the zip files, which are the source code for some computer science textbook and whatever, can still live on their old web server and they can uh, migrate that over later. Um, yeah, we spent a lot of, as Alex mentioned, we had to spend a lot of time uh, working on cron timeouts uh, as we were running migration nightly, because we need to do a nightly sync of their bibliographic data. Um, we ended up doing that uh, by making a queue worker. Um, uh, yeah, so that was, that was interesting, uh, but that was a major difference. That was the major difference between our dev environments where, of course, we all set the PHP timeout to be negative one and the memory limit to be negative one. Uh, then you go to your, your production environment and, hey, why doesn't the system want to do that? Um, well, at least we were using Docker for our development. Yeah. Yeah. So, so we, we did have that control. Um, um, yeah. We, I mean, other things like these are just small, uh, like go live checklists that would be common to any site. We made sure their Google Analytics footer was there. Um, uh, we made sure we had to turn off Devel, we had to make sure that the live site's domain was whitelisted because Drupal 8 is, of course, is a concept of trusted domains. Um, uh, we had to, uh, um, in, and since the, the live site will be accessible by many domains, like with and without the www uh, by over port 80 or port 443, so with or without SSL, you need to pick one canonical domain and make sure that everything redirects there for SEO purposes. So. Uh, that's something you need to do right when you go live. Um, we did a final performance audit, so uh, front end, there are a variety of tools for that, so the page loading time in the browser, as well as back end. Um, that was with a, a tool called uh, Blackfire, um, which uh, uh, my colleague, uh, uh, colleagues uh, Jigar and Alex gave a presentation on earlier today, so I'll just assume you all saw that. Um, yeah, I mean, you turn on CSS aggregation at the end, I mean, the standard things. Uh, Pantheon has their own launch checklist, which is uh, very helpful, some, some of which is specific to that environment, some of which is not, um, and their own backup system, so you just have to make sure that you click the button to say, make me a daily backup. 
Um, uh, we are doing monitoring with the service Pingdom. If you, uh, so that'll hit the site once a minute and send us an email if it's down. Uh, I mean, you should do this for any live site with that or some equivalent service. Um, post launch. So these are things that are yet to come. So once the site goes live, uh, we will need to have a support agreement in place. So the details of that are still being negotiated with this particular client, but that's something that, uh, I mean, just like when you've got a car, you always need the phone number of a mechanic, right? So we're the mechanics, and, and just as you folks are. Um, uh, future features would be uh, fixing the, right now the book URLs are literally title slash uh, a random five digit number dot html so which is amazing for SEO maybe that'll change um, there's there's other things like their uh, like PHP lists for running their mailing list they know they need to move off of that um, they could have better uh, meta, meta tags for discoverability on Facebook etc uh, two really big things yeah more more automated views so the list of books that came out in the last week is written by hand currently in Dreamweaver, and now it's going to be just, here's a static page, here's a basic page type in Drupal, and I'm gonna click at it, and I'm gonna type in all the books that came out this week. So maybe we can automate that, since we have a database of all the books and their date of publication. That would probably save somebody some time. Um, virtue Sales, yeah, Virtue Sales is a, is a, um, a very large um, a software package that, like this is a year, minimum one year migration that they're in the process of doing. That, uh, that will manage all of their book inventory, their sales, will push data uh, to, to Amazon and all their other distributors. It will handle, uh, I think it'll even handle online sales, I'm not sure about that. But that'll be a massive change on their end and so we'll need to up, uh, uh, change the migration source to pull from that data source eventually. Um, but we did as much as possible yeah. to prepare for it. Yeah, so we did, we did what we could, but um, that that's changes, when, when they are ready to launch that, we're, changes will be needed to the website. And at some point they want to do a major design overhaul, but they're not even planning to start that until like uh, 2018. So when that, uh, we're gonna have to be involved, or the website will need to be updated for that, but uh, they weren't ready. So uh, we did that um, with the current design, as Alex was saying. Project management. Um, so here's uh, this is the team. There are a couple other people who did like a smaller number of hours, but for the most part, um, uh, we had two people um, uh, doing back-end development. Uh, Giga is in the back of the room in the, the bright shirt. Uh, uh, and David isn't here today. We had one person doing front-end development. Uh, so all of that, so the parts of the views, all the CSS. Um, we had an intern doing some QA. Um, uh, my, uh, so my boss, Alex, doing the business lead, like negotiating contracts. My other boss, Suzanne, was the lead on training for the content editors. Uh, and a designer, and then myself, I was doing project management as well as code review, because I come from a development background. Um, so we had several days of meetings on site, seven calendar days, that's more person days um, than that. Um, uh, right, several demos, some in person, some over video calls. Uh, we had, we asked the client for a single point of contact, and then I was the single point of contact uh, on our end. If you don't have that, it's impossible. Um, I've, had, uh, I've had clients where there's like five different people you're supposed to talk to and you end up just like playing referee. That doesn't get you anywhere. And I'm, I'm sure you all have a horror story about that. Um, we had a backlog log of tasks. So we, had, uh, we would sign like contracts with them that included like a long list of, uh, like actually had like our red mine ticket numbers and we would provide them a list of the things we needed to do that we thought needed to be done with estimates in terms of hours and they would tell us, okay, do these in this scope, these ones, these are nice to have. I should, I should jump in to yeah. add that that was sort of covering the last 40% of the time. Yeah. First 60% of the time was us doing this audit, figuring out what the hell is over there, and then just saying, oh my God, and then just saying, okay, let's see what, what we need to do. So yeah. the, the part that was really non-negotiable, that's still a lot of people say that can yeah. store this, let's migrate that into Drupal, let's build a theme that, that reflects all the data that we have. Uh, that we kind of just did. But once we got to the, the fine, the fine points, the, the little nice to have features, such as related offers that they didn't need to have to go live, they just happened to have it from five years ago. Do you still need it? Do you want to pay for it? Or do you want to spend your money somewhere else? That's where we moved to this model. Yeah, um, yeah, and uh, the client. One thing the client was very good at is that. Um, well, so in the discovery phase, we found the site was the current data was a little more complex than we thought. Uh, and by the way, pulling in a, uh, a very complex data set means that we had to use a very strange data structure inside of Drupal. I mean, we would have come up with something 
that made a lot more sense and would be easier to build views around um, in, in Drupal if we had had the choice of the, the data model. But since we had to retain their data model, we had to use, we had to do things in, a, in, in an awkward way in Drupal. So it's doable, but it takes longer. Um, but uh, other than that, uh, th I would say there was no major uh, scope creep from the, from the client. We had our list of nice-to-haves, and as we found complexity that we had to fix somewhere, uh, a bunch of those got crossed off in order to have the time to, to uh, deal, deal with those other issues. On the right is just a screenshot from a base camp, which is what we were using to communicate with the client, and we were using Redmine internally. Um, this is a rough timeline. Um, uh, maybe I'll think the next slide might be more interesting. This is a, a rough division of, uh, so the work happened over five months. Um, so here's roughly the percentage of who was doing what, or which team was doing what work at what point. Um, uh, coordination and code review is uh, together in one item because it was one, it was me doing it, so uh, uh, I'm not sure of the exact breakdown, but otherwise it was about a third of front end and back end and the, the management uh, reviews uh, portion. Um, yeah, do you want to do the summary? Uh, yeah, sure, so, and then we'll show you the site. Don't yeah. Worry, the <laughs> uh, yeah, so, uh, basically you guys, you guys saw you know, we discovered things in scoping that were a little bit more complex than we initially thought. Uh, we were kind of had our hands tied for the design, but that helped because the design usually is the part where things go off the rails. So that, yeah, so that that didn't happen. We we just told our designer, you've got 10 hours, make it look like the current site, but modern, responsive, clean, and whenever in doubt, just make it look like the current site. And he came back with something everybody liked. Uh, we we did a very complex migration with lots of fields and lots of records, uh, and a substantial amount of custom code to support the, the things that we talked about for the nightly sync. Um, there's, a, there's a content cleanup phase going on right now, so while we're hanging out here at a fun little conference, uh, people are working hard. Uh, and, uh, and so we did the deployment. We, we went with Pantheon just because it was quite economical. They, they previously had been doing static hosting, so they weren't quite ready to spend tens of thousands of dollars a year on a at an enterprise hosting account, so Pantheon was a nice compromise between good level of service, but not not so much. Um, they might they have a they have 500 or 600 thousand page views a month. Through, uh, it's a really really huge amount of traffic, so we're going to see how that goes. So we're doing a soft launch for that, and uh, yeah, and for for we'll be entering this sort of maintenance and ongoing building mode where, in parallel or in, in maybe in advance of their big redesign, uh, and and their Migration to virtual sales, we'll be adding these little nice to have features that we deprioritize de during this phase, or other things that the, their stakeholders, now that the site goes live, now that the site has changed substantially for the first time in 10 years, I'm absolutely sure that there's going to be a ton of stakeholders who come out of the woodwork and tell us what everything is wrong, you know, that, that weren't even part of the conversation. So that's what the maintenance agreement is hopefully going to be comprehensive enough for. Um, we, we, we kind of caught off guard on, on this last minute. Checking migrations in Cron and Pantheon with uh, client provided SSTP credentials. So we had to work on that uh, quite last minute. Um, we were surprised by the complexity of their legacy code base, but I guess we shouldn't have been. Uh, also, same thing with the content cleanup, but fortunately, the, the client's content team stepped up to, to handle the bulk of that. And also, we, uh, we probably should have. We should have, should have done the training for the editor experience a little bit sooner so we'd have more time to do that. I'm kind of sorry that it was at the end and, and we just did the bare minimum but for, for now. Yeah, in terms of the like usability for the actual content editors, because there's still a lot to, to, for them to fix manually or to update manually. Yeah. And uh, they, uh, I mean, the user interface is usable, but Drupal can do better and yeah. we didn't put effort into that because we needed our time elsewhere. Yeah, so, and that's, that's Drupal 8, it's not Drupal 7, so out of the box it's already 10 times as good. So that's, that's great and they're, and they're happy, but we are, you know, know that they could, we could do them better. Beats, yeah, one of them was using Notepad, so we've, 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 uh, we've given her a better experience than that. And uh, so the timeline, it did shift a little bit, especially with having the soft launch, especially with this content cleanup, that's, that's, that's not what we quite expected. Uh, but you know everyone's reasonably happy and uh, in terms of the, the vast majority of the development uh, happened in May and June which for an organization like this <coughs> happened eight times as fast as anyone expected this this project has this 
been in discussion for, for, for years before we came along. So, so we kind of came in, most of our team, we have a very small team, we kind of came in and sliced and diced with machetes and got through all their, all their complexity and really built a minimum viable product. Uh, we gave them you know, just enough input to say what's more important, but not to add new crazy things, and they were really good at not doing that. So thanks to this really good collaboration, uh, we were able to achieve a lot. At the same time, we weren't able to achieve everything. Uh, we, we, evolving Web, we only do time and materials contracts, and so the client is perhaps justifiably a little bit miffed with us coming back and saying, you have to choose between things. Guys, this is complex stuff, and, and our schedule is what it is. You know, you can't add more weeks to the schedule without adding more budget. So, uh, you know, we, we, we did a bit of a compromise. We gave some more hours, the client gave them some features, and everyone is reasonably happy with the result. So, this, this is kind of the project, and uh, just, just to give you the, the demo. So let's show them the legacy site first. Yeah. So here's the site. You guys saw a screenshot of it. Here's, here's the lovely search. Two searches. Yeah, here's one, two searches. One, one, does, uh, one is just the Google Books like full text search. The other, you, uh, you get to choose the title or the author or the ISBN. Basically, everyone who works there uses the one on the left. Anyone else uses the one on the right. Um, yeah, two shopping carts, US dollars and UK pounds. Yeah. And, and, and here's a site, like, here's a book. Yeah. It's a pretty simple one, this one. Uh, so the new site is on the edu. Uh, and so it just looks a little bit more modern. It's like we advertised. There's a, there's a, can I show them the show more? If you scroll up, yeah. Some of these are really long, well it's not that long, but sometimes the reviews, I mean, sometimes a book could have 100 reviews, or sometimes an author, like, uh, would be a list of all the awards that an author or a book have won, and like, I mean, if somebody won a Nobel Prize, he really wants that on that website. Um, I mean, I probably would do if it gave me a Nobel <laughs> Prize. But uh, yeah, it gets, it gets lengthy, and then you can't, uh, you can't, quickly scan the page and see the important parts, or the table of contents. I mean, that's important information, but it's also often pretty long, so that's always collapsed by default, for example. Great. Uh, so, with, with that, I mean, I don't want to go into too much of the, of the site, since it's, it's, it's really a, a lift and shift in spirit, and uh, it's supposed to be a great, clean code base and a great, clean platform for them to, to do their design overhaul. Yeah. So that's, that's really what we achieved. Uh, do, you guys, do you guys have any questions for us on this? Hi. Why do you guys uh, still have two shopping carts? Uh, that's, a, yeah, that's a business decision for them. Which This is just the way the publishing industry works. Like Often uh, the rights to sell a book will be, will be specific to like, geographical regions. So like, for example, like uh, Harry Potter, like the, the, the company that sells that in, uh, I think it's Scholastic in the US, Raintree in Canada, and I can't remember who in the UK. That's just how the rights to the book were, were, were split up. Yeah, so, so a it's much, a, and a much better user experience would be to have a, a single shopping cart and then the order being fulfilled by the different things. So that's on the backlog of, of nice to yeah, have but, and but, subject to budgets and yeah, schedules. But the, the, those two shopping carts, it's literally like a line of JavaScript each and like the shopping cart is not managed by the site even though you see a number. That's all external platforms. And one of them is going to switch but the fact that there are two is not changing. And that's just the, the nature of the book distribution business. Because there isn't a, there isn't. They don't have a separate website for different countries like Amazon does. They just have one, so they need to to have that listed there. Okay. Any other questions? Chris. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I don't think we have time to do that, and in fact, I think Jigger in the back. Is the guy to pick, yeah. pick his brain out. But I, I can, I can tell you, Chris, that I mean, we, we get. I know you know this, but oh uh, yeah, we, we, we get that the Drupal module uh, model is open source, contributing back to the community, so other people can fix your bugs for you. Um, and yeah, there's we've got a in our issue tracker, we've got a, a list of uh, blog posts and uh, pa core patches and things like that to to give back some of this complexity. 
uh, to the Drupal community. Some are little debugging uh, uh, modules that we think will be useful for people writing migrations. Another, the, uh, the doing a join between multiple CSVs. That, that was, a, that was, a, yeah, that was our, our developer, Dave, who thought of that one. That was a real good brainwave. Um, that saved us a lot of time. So yeah, we, this stuff will be showing up on a drupal.org near you, uh, but it isn't all there yet. But in the meantime, Jigar at the back would be probably, I'm going to speak for you, Jigar. We'll be happy to answer more specific questions about that and uh, if you have any after the talk. Great. Any other questions? Going once, going twice. So, all right. And before oh. you go, <laughs> no, 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 wait. The, most, a joke. Important, the okay. most important slide and the slide that pays for us to come here and give this talk is uh, my, my wife Suzanne is doing lots of upcoming trainings. She probably have met her and then went to her three talks and a training yesterday. So uh, the most relevant one is going to be the Ottawa one, September 11th to 15th. She's doing a whole week of training. So if you have any interest in learning Drupal 8 or if you have colleagues, whether it's site building, theming, module development, she's got a week of training scheduled in Ottawa. Please, please send people our way. And our trainings are pretty good, better than our presentation. <laughs> She's so, practiced more. Yeah. So thanks, thanks very much.